What is up guys, Randomonium here. So uh, Riot's been putting out a ton of new lore recently. They have a new website that's dedicated exclusively to League of Legends lore, and recently they've been putting up a lot of great information on Piltover and Azan. Uh, however, one of the most exciting things in the new Piltover lore is a map of the area that is surrounding Piltover. And uh, this map is written by Jago Medarda, and he is one of the rulers of the most influential clans in Piltover, according to the lore. So if we look at the map, we can see that most of the map is Noxian territory, and you can tell that based off of the, the double-bladed uh, axe symbol around a lot of uh, these cities. And you can even see Noxus in the northern portion of the map, and what this kind of indicates is that the Noxian Empire probably stretches much further to the north as well, since typically the capital of an empire is near the center of the empire, not near one of the edges. So Noxus is probably a massive, massive empire, and we're only seeing part of their empire in this map. So in the center of the map, we've got Piltover, which is called the City of Progress. Um, and we learn from the Piltover stories that Zaun and Piltover are two cities that were founded in close proximity together, but have grown kind of further and further apart as time progresses. They are two sides of the same coin. Piltover is this shining beacon, and Zaun is a darkened city covered in pollution known only as the Grey. However, through subtle clues, we can find out that Piltover isn't as pure or as noble as their towering spires and clean streets would indicate. Deep in his cups, Gisbert has told her Progress Day is viewed very differently down in his hometown of Zaun, which he insists was the original City of Progress before Piltover came along. Above, Progress Day marks the moment the sun gates opened for the first time, allowing trade to pass easily between the east and west of Valoran. It also marks the moment when taxation on that trade turned the trickle of gold entering the city's coffers into a fast-flowing river. Below in Zaun, it is a day to remember those lost in the geological upheaval that created the east-west passage and submerged entire districts underwater. Further down, it reads... The city opens up before her, revealing the great split that divides northern and southern Piltover. The yawning chasm looks as though it ought to be ancient, the result of natural geological forces, but it came into existence within living memory, and nothing natural created it. Man's hubris and desire to master the elements wrought it. Tamara admires the strength of will it must have taken to enact a plan of such audacity that the splitting of the earth and the destruction of half of Zaun was seen as an acceptable price to pay for the future of prosperity. What this tells us is that sometime in the recent past, the rich and powerful of Piltover engineered an experiment which caused a massive tectonic event, which literally ripped the earth apart and created the water passage between the east and the west uh, that we see on the map here. However, this event was so destructive that it destroyed most of Zaun and most likely resulted in the death of thousands. It was a mass murder event done solely to make Piltover the center of trade in all Valoran. We also learn in Camille's story the horrifying truth of the origin of Hextech crystals and the pollution that plagues Azan. Camille's family gained most of its wealth through a rare crystal harvested from a creature native to the sands of a distant valley. These first hex crystals, or first crystals, contained power normally reserved to those born with innate magical ability. Camille's great-great-aunt Alicia lost an arm and nearly her life during one such early expedition. Her sacrifice was celebrated, and it set the expectation that is still reflected in the Pharaoh's family model today, for family will I give. 
The creatures that Alicia Pharaohs found, the Brackern, were not an unending resource, and Camille's family had to look for ways to augment the crystals they had accumulated. Utilizing certain shadow investments in chemtech and runic alchemy, the Pharaohs family brought to market the less powerful but easier to procure synthetic hex crystals. Such power often comes with consequences, and the production of synthetic crystals is rumored to be a heavy contributor to the Zon Grey. For those of you who don't know, the Brackern are Skarner's race, indicating that Camille's family, part of Piltover's elite, is responsible for the genocide of Skarner's race. When I first read Skarner's updated lore, I automatically assumed it was Noxians who were responsible for the tragedy. To learn that such a crime was committed by Piltover in the name of progress and profits is all the more chilling and shows how dark the world of Valoran has become. And from Skarner's lore we can read, When the soft skins came, the ground knew only pain. Our songs became cries at which we were torn and broken and scattered. I heard the sorrow song as the soft skins unearthed my kin. They tore crystal name stones from our bodies as we screamed, louder than earthquakes, and stole them away. I sang long into the many nights, sang until my heart was empty and cold, but they did not return. In the south of the map, we can see the northern edge of Shurima, as indicated by the sun disk stamp over many of the cities. On several of the cities, we can see that the sun disk has been scratched out and replaced with the double axes of Noxus, indicating that the Noxian invasion of Shurima is well underway. Under each of the cities conquered by Noxus, you can see that their Shuriman title has been replaced with Steward. In some cases, the Shreeman rulers have maintained control. My guess is that, like the Roman Empire, Noxus offers cities a chance to join them willingly, as long as they are subservient to Noxus. If the rulers of the city refuse, then Noxus takes the city by force and culls the population and the ruling class until they are subservient. We see this in Belzahun, where two separate Shreemian rulers... Valif and Emif Sai are crossed out and replaced with Stuart Doric, which is a much more Noxian name. My guess is that Belzahun was the first Shuriman city approached by Noxus, and then when the leaders of Belzahun refused, Noxus decided to make an example out of them. This caused the rulers of Urzeris and Ter Eshni to buckle and embrace Noxian rule, while Kalamanda and Nashrame still resist the Noxian invasion. Moving further to the east, we have Kumangra, which has four leaders crossed out. Beneath we read, feels like a new contact every month, Fickle Kumangrans. It's unclear whether these former leaders were assassinated, or if there's some sort of democracy in Kumangra. But based on the tone we've seen in the stories and the rest of the map, my bet is on the former rather than the latter, indicating that Kumangra might be a rather dangerous and unstable place indeed. Continuing further to the east, we have Mudtown and Bilgewater with the note, Too Risky with the Black Mist. We also see some type of dragon or sea monster drawing to the west of Bilgewater. I wonder if this is an artistic representation of Naga Keboros, the god of Alawi. Moving north, we go back into Noxian territory, and if we continue north, we can see a tiny little bit of land in the very northeastern corner of the map. This is the edge of Ionia, an island continent that has resisted the Noxian invasion and is home to some of the League's most famous and infamous champions. The last area of the map I want to talk about is on the western side of the map. Here we can see the towns of Glorf and Paycliff that do not have the Noxian stamp, indicating that they aren't part of the empire. Above Paycliff, we even see this note saying, No Noxians permitted ashore. No exceptions. 
Above that node, we can also see a arrow pointing west to Demacia and the note, no official trade permitted. Underneath Demacia, there's a note that reads, east of Needlebrook, two nights after the new moon. Moonlight makes fools of young lovers. I think this note indicates that Jago uh, has a contact within Demacia that he's meeting to discuss trading opportunities with. It's unclear whether Demacia or Noxus or both are enforcing this trade ban with Piltover. My guess is that Noxus has forbidden Piltover from trading with Demacia because they're worried about Demacia gaining access to Hextech weaponry. Finally, by the Compass Rose, we have another arrow indicating that the Freljord is to the west. My guess is since there's no notes regarding the Freljord, it's probably much further away than Demacia, probably on the northwestern edge of the continent. Also missing from the map is Mount Targon. My guess, based on Mount Targon's description of it being located far from civilization and being utterly remote, along with the fact that Tarek is Demacian, that indicates to me that Mount Targon is somewhere between Demacia and the Freljord range. Overall, I'm extremely excited about all the lore that has been coming out recently. Riot seems to be painting a very dark and mature world full of mystery, magic, deception, war, and conflict, and I absolutely love it. I highly encourage you to check out the new League of Legends universe site, which I'll link in the video description below. Everything I've talked about in this video is just the tip of the iceberg, so you definitely should check it out. Please leave a comment below on what you think about the new lore, and hit that like button if you want me to do more lore-inspired videos in the future. If you enjoy the content on this channel, please show your support and subscribe. I hope you all have a fantastic day. This is Randomonium, signing off.